Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce Thomas Schiff. He's from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, he has done some uh, nice work on the um, uh, Monte Carlo and uh, probabilistic program. So, the talk today is Sequential Monte Carlo and the machine learning toolbox. So, let's uh, thank the welcome the speaker. And thanks for the invitation. Can you hear me here? Yeah, all good. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about sequential Monte Carlo. And I was thinking when I got this invitation whether I should uh, focus on my newest technical result or do a bit more of a trying to do a pedagogical introduction to SMC for those who have not necessarily worked with it. So I'm going to do the latter and try to give you the idea. I'm not going to do a mathematical derivation of it, but I'm going to try and give you the key ideas, the key mechanisms that underlying SMC. And then I'll show you how this can fit in to some machine learning problems and some ongoing um, developments, which is why I call, refer to it as blending here, where we use, in particular, variational inference together with SMC in various ways. And there I foresee a great future. So I don't, see, I don't see it as it's one or the other. I think for the future, I think it's more a bit of both. And how can we put these algorithms together such that we use the good bits and pieces from, from each one. All right, so let's have a look at an introductory toy example to understand what SNC does. So we consider a, a simple one-dimensional localization problem where you, you need to localize an aircraft flying around in 1D or rather 2D, I guess, but we only want to localize with respect to the x-axis. This aircraft has a, a, a radar on board. The radar measures the distance down to ground. And it also has a train map of the operational area. And then uh, it has a barometer, so it knows its height over sea. So then it can do what, what you did before you had these things and orient yourself in a new city like this one. You looked at a piece of paper and then you looked up and you saw what you saw in the surroundings and based on what you saw you could maybe deduce where you were and if you couldn't then you would just move somewhere else until you saw a new landmark and then you can lock in and know where you are. So this is the same idea that we're going to use in aircraft. And this is, by the way, the way many fighter aircraft is navigated. So we have actually implemented this in the Swedish fighter to solve the navigation problem. So we did that during my PhD which is a while ago now. <laughs> so, so that was back in 2005, I think, four. And we actually implemented it on board the aircraft back then. So, so it does work in real, critical real-time solutions. Anyway, the dynamics we have here in this little example is quite simple. So it's just integrating velocity to get the position. It has some noise on top of that. The measurements are highly nonlinear since they correspond to a lookup in the database. The database is whatever it is, but it's definitely not linear. So you, you can implement this by trying to linearize the database, uh, but then you need a lot of surrounding code making sure that actually works. So where, whereas with SMC, you just put in the database. It's just another non-Gaussian distribution, so to speak. And the task is then to figure out the position. And we're going to do that by computing the distribution of the position at time t, conditional on all the measurements up to time. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. So let's have a look at um, the solution. So I haven't told you how the filter works. I'm just going to show what happens if we apply it to this, to this setting. So the first measurement comes in. We're flying it at 80 meters. And the radar tells us that it's 60 meters down the ground. And you have the map with you. And then I run one update. So I, I use this one measurement. And I update from my initial uh, guess. My initial guess, I should also say, is a com uniform. So I say I have no idea where the aircraft is. You just say a uniform over, over the x-axis here. And then you do one update. And then you get this uh, approximation of the media. So if you look at that and think about what I've said, so does that sort of make sense or, or not? Quite a, quite a few notes. Question? Yeah, sorry. Could you just one more time, what we we have the barometer and what else? Uh, like how does the what measurements do we have again? So the, the x-axis is the position and the y-axis is just the, the value of this PDF. So the higher the value, the more probable 
to that particular position. And then um, we're flying at 80 meters and we get the information that it's 60 meters down to ground. And if we then um, look at the uh, intersection, that's why I've drawn this dashed line here. So where that dashed line intersects with the terrain map, those are the positions where we could have been given that first measurement. And if you look at the PDF that, uh, that SMC spits out, you see that you have high probability mass in, in all those areas. So that's at least uh, reassuring. And the particle filtering, in order to do this, uh, it maintains uh, an, a representation that corresponds to point masses spread out in state space with weights associated to them. And informally, you can think of the weight as some kind of information, how probable is that particular sample. That's not exactly true, but you can for intuition. Um, and then if we take, they just, uh, oh, let me just take one step forward. Take one step forward, the following happen, take another one. And if we stop and look here, you now see, so I've drawn in blue up there, you see the terrain profile that we have seen. And we have high probability mass basically in two areas. And if you look around 60, x equal to 60 meters, the ground profile around there looks more or less the same. So it makes sense that we have high probability mass in those areas. After that, it starts changing. And after a while, <coughs> it locks in and then it keeps the position. And this works fine as long as you're not flying over water because then this way of measuring is not very informative, right? But if, as long as you're flying over ground, this is fine. Um, and this highlights two key, key capabilities of sequential Monte Carlo, or the particle filter as I refer to here. And one of them is that you can automatically handle an unknown and dynamically changing number of hypotheses of what's going on, so you don't have to worry about yourself. And it works with non-linear non-Gaussian models. So that, that's uh, one, one example. And then you can, so this can be used with many different maps. I'll show you another example for indoor positioning using maps of uh, the magnetic field. Because in here we have a really interesting uh, magnetic field, since there's so much metal here that's causing deviations in the Earth magnetic field. And if you can then build a map of that, all of you, many of you, have the sensor that you need, have a smartphone like this with a magnetometer, can I use that and position you within a meter or two? Um, all right, so I'm trying to give you the key mechanisms of, of what I just showed, and then um, show a few ways in which this could fit into the machine learning toolbox. I'm going to do that by explaining a bit more about SMC, what it does via dynamical systems or sequence modeling, if you like. And then I'm going to step back a bit and, and, and see that SMC is actually way more general, at least than I first thought. So when I did the work looked at here, I thought it was just nonlinear dynamics, but you can actually use it. It's way more general than that. And then towards the end, I, I, it should probably be blended. Let, let's get back to that when we get there. All right. So, how do we represent the nonlinear dynamical systems? Well, typically we use a Markov chain, um, where, where, which makes use of a, of a latent representation of the, of the thing we want to model. You can think of the aircraft if you want that we just look at, where you receive measurements of the ground distance, that's your measurement, and the, the state x was your, your latent Markov space. So these are two, two variables. The, the blue is the Markov chain, the x which is modeled as some nonlinear change based on the previous steps and some noise on top of that, and then some measurement equation that tells you how are your measurements related to that state. And if you don't like that, you can draw it as a graphical model, and it, it's a fairly simple graphical model in that it's just a chain graph with measurements attached to each. Or you can represent it using probability distributions, if you like, or you can represent it using a pro programmatic model, as I call it, which is what you have in probabilistic programming languages. So we recently built, we're studying that a bit, trying to automate this inference. So we built an, a language we call Birch that's available as a pre-release. Um, and if, if I'm not going to talk more about that here, but it's really geared towards automating these algorithms. That's one, one cool, let me say one, one thing I think is pretty cool, that you have conjugate gradients sits inside. So if you, if you show it a linear 
Gaussian system, then it will automatically assemble the Kalman filter. No one told Birch about the Kalman filter, we just told Birch about conjugate priors and how they work. So then it automatically fits, assembles that algorithm as we go. And this, I, this is something I think is really cool where I want to see more work. I'm definitely going to dedicate time there myself. How can we automate the construction of algorithms? Many of, at least I, and I think many of you as well, we sit thinking about how can I come up with a new algorithm to solve this thing? What if you can come up with the mechanisms that come up with the algorithm you need for your model? That would be pretty cool. So we managed to do a little, a simple but not, not uh, uh, trivial example of that, which is the so-called Rao black equalized particle filters. So Birch will automatically put that together, and we have never coded a, a Rao black equalized particle filter inside. Anyhow, um, so based on that, I can write down the full probabilistic model, which is, as usual, it's a likelihood times the prior, and we have a lot of structure here, so the dynamics and the observation comes in and explain what, what, the, um, what the prior and the likelihood should look like. Um, and the nonlinear filtering problems, I'm going to drop the thetas. I haven't even mentioned the thetas yet, I guess, the parameters. We're just going to look at the state today. Um, and the nonlinear filtering problem boils down to solving these equations, which are, it's, quite straightforward to derive these equations, it's just a few few lines, but then the simple, and that's pretty cool that you can do that, but then the, the simple thing stops, because then we need to solve these for a nonlinear uh, or non-Gaussian system, and that you cannot do in closed form, that's why we have methods like variational inference, or, or the class method, or sequential Monte Carlo, whatever your, your favorite tool is. So we solve them approximately instead. And SMC has a good thing with it, which is that asymptotically it will converge to the true, true solution. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is that can be quite expensive, computationally. So this is what we need to solve. So what SMC does, um, it's, it's, it, you can also view it as a way of solving integrals. And integrals when there is some kind of sequential structure present. And here, the sequential structure is pretty clear because it's a dynamical system. So you go from one state to the next and to the next, like the chain graph, if you like. So it's clear that we have a sequential structure. Um, and then again, we do that by maintaining this uh, empirical distribution, uh, which we then keep updating. So those of you who are familiar to, to important sampling, this is sequentially important sampling. So we do important sampling sequentially with a very particular proposal distribution, and then we add something called resampling on top of that. So the algorithm looks like this. Again, I'm skipping a fair bit here in terms of deriving what, what, why it looks like this. I'm just telling you the, what it looks like in its simplest form, I would say. Um, and for those of you, I'm going to use a bit of Kalman intuition for those of you who know the Kalman filter which is the solution to the filtering problem when you have a linear Gaussian system. So then everything is nice and I can use pen and paper and just write down the closed form solution because then the distribution is described by the mean and the variance and you just update them and you know everything. So the propagation step, that's in the common world, it's referred to as the time update or prediction or, or whatever you call it, which means you use your model and then you predict one step forward in time. So in the in this SMC, this corresponds to just inserting your most recent state into the model for your dynamics and propagate one step forward in time. Gives you the new, the new uh, state. When you've done that, then you have a weighting step. So the weighting step in the Karman world, this is the, well, the measurement update. Some new piece of information comes in, you need to update your, your state. Here, this is done using an importance sampling uh, fashion. So the weights take account of the fact that there is a discrepancy between the proposal distribution and the target distribution that you're trying to figure out. And it explains exactly how big is that discrepancy. And it does that by dividing the proposal with the, uh, the target. And in this particular case, it turns out to be the, the likelihood itself, which intuitively is, is um, 
is also correct, I think, because the likelihood, as I said before, the ways you can think of them, how probable is that particular particle, that state, and the likelihood tells you exactly that. So it's intuitively correct that the likelihood pops out. Um, and then you have resampling, which is maybe less intuitive but necessary, and you can, which you can prove mathematically. If you like. And resampling corresponds to just randomly selecting uh, uh, capital M particles to keep the others who get thrown away. So if you don't do this, then you're back at important sampling with a very specific proposal. Then we can show that the variance of the weights will blow up. They will tend to infinity, so algorithm completely useless. Whereas with resampling, you keep that in check, and you have something that you can keep operating for as long as you want. And it will in, indeed converge to the true filter distribution, which is pretty cool. Um, let's skip that. So in words, well, we said that, so let's skip that. Let's have a look at another uh, example where we use this. Uh, so this is an example uh, that I'm borrowing from, from some friends in Alto. We, we were involved in the mapping part, and then they did actually make use of this to compute the position in doors. So again, your task is to figure out what's your position in doors, because GPS doesn't work here, so we might want to do that. And um, again, the magnetic field, and this is also something I think where way more things can be done in the future. In terms of maps, we have, when I say a map, many of you think the same thing I do, just a piece of paper with, with a map. But today, with these things and the sensors we have, we can build maps of so many other things than what our stereo camera system can see, right? For example, the magnetic field, which sits here and gets distorted all the time. If you can just figure out what, what is the magnetic field looking like in the camera, <coughs> then you can use that using, for example, the principle I just described to position yourself without any extra hardware than what you have, what many people have in, in your pocket anyway. Um, so first you need to build a map because they don't exist. Um, so how do you build a map? So what we did, we tailored a Gaussian process to do that work for us. Um, which, yes, as yeah, yeah, those who have been working with Gaussian processes, they do scale to large data these days, so there's not, not a problem at all, not diving into the details. One thing I'm a bit proud of with this is that we actually built a Gaussian process that's guaranteed to obey Maxwell's law. <laughs> Unfortunately, that didn't really help. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think mathematically, I think it's super cool that that can be done, and I'm sure there are other examples where that is important. <coughs> Because if, if you have fundamental knowledge about nature, which we have in some cases, it makes sense to use that. We don't necessarily have to learn everything from data, right? The question is, how do you put that into a, into a Gaussian process? So that's why we, that's the, what we did uh, last year, uh, describe how you can put linear constraints into a Gaussian process. So the Gaussian process will for sure obey those linear operator constraints like Maxwell's equations, that's a linear operator constraint. But it will be completely uncertain in all other ways, and the data needs to come in. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll skip the movie there. But based on that, we have a map. Based on that map, we can then do exactly what I, what I showed you in the beginning. The only difference is that the map is different and the measurements are different. So that means we need a, a different model for the, for the measurement. And actually, the, the model for the person walking around is more or less the same we had for the fighter aircraft. It's just an integrated model. It's not the same. Let's see if I can show you the movie of what that looks like. Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll show you the movie if I can get the map. So this is um, a little mobile robot uh, that is driving around on a floor indoors, and then the little uh, tail that gets left on the floor is the strength of the magnetic field. So the mag it's a vector field, so we actually computing the entire vector field, but I'm only visualizing the, the strength of the field. So there is um, uh, some kind of piping underneath here, I guess. But the key takeaway is that this is clearly informative. This is not just flat. So that's what we need to be able to, to position. Uh, okay, let's 
what does the color mean? And the, why is the it color different? is the magnitude in micro Tesla. And why is it different? A different place? So it's different because there is metal structure in the floor <coughs> that is different. I guess some pipings or some armings or what, whatever. <coughs> Let's see if we now use that map uh, and try to position ourselves. So what you see here, 20 meters, this is the office environment in, in, uh, in Mons office in, in Alto. So the particles are these little uh, uh, yellow dots and the true position is down here. And our estimate is over here, the mean estimate I should say. And the uncertainty is the, the big blue thing. Importantly, at this point, we, we know that we should not e compute a mean estimate, because that would be horrible. How can I know that? Because I have a particle representation of the, of the PDF, of the position. And if you look at those yellow points, it, you should not compute the mean estimate when it looks like that, right? Because then you know for sure that it will be wrong. So there's no reason to even compute it. That's a good thing when you have a representation like that. Then as we move around, start, start moving along the corridor down here, then after a while it locks on, which is not so strange because the map is highly informative and as long as you've been moving for a while, you have seen enough of the magnetic distortion so you know where, where you are. Do you have a question? So you're jointly inferring the map and the position? A good question. Not here. Here we did the map first and then we used the map. Um, but what you ask is super interesting. So that's the slam from the simultaneous localization of mapping. That has actually been done as well um, by, um, uh, by Arno, the first author, and Manon Koch. So that was published this, this summer, um, which, which can be done. Yes. Um, all right, let's, um, let's have a look. So that's in terms of using SNC for dynamical systems. Let's step back a bit and look at it more abstractly. Because this, so what, when, again, when I started doing it, I thought that was it. Now I have a completely different viewpoint, and it's actually way more general than, than, than at least I first thought. So the distribution of interest, I just call it pi of x, uh, call it the, the target distribution. So the problem formulation that SMC looks at is that how can I sample from a sequence of probability distributions, some, which is, um, defined on a sequence of spaces of increasing dimension. So, so this pi is then given by pi tilde, which is the unnormalized target, divided by z. Um, and I have some requirements, and they are that I can pointwise evaluate this unnormalized target by tilde. And z is typically computationally challenging. So whenever this is true, you can use SMC. And then you can use SMC to as we have seen, approximate the, the target distribution or to compute some intervals with respect to that target or approximating the normalizing constant. And you can actually show, and this is not, not trivial, at least not to me, you can show that the, even if you knew, use a finite number of particles, you will get an unbiased uh, uh, approximation of the normalization constant. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes that's really important. For example, if you want to blend SMC with MCMC, that's highly important because that's what you need to mathematically be able to do that, which was done in a really nice paper back in 2010. Again, how general is it? Well, it's, it's, it's very general. <coughs> so as long as you can come up with a sequence of target distribution, and that you can do in many, many different ways for many different problems. So the problem we have looked at is this um, simple chain graph where, again, pi, we don't know, we want to find, pi tilde, that's just the joint distribution of the states and the, and the measurements. That I can evaluate. If you just give me the states and, and the measurements, I can evaluate that pointwise, which was a requirement. The normalizing constant is still hard to find. But you can, you can do this um, uh, in any graphical model, for example. So even if there is no you know, obvious sequence, you can introduce an artificial sequence of target distributions such that when you have been tracking through all the, all the nodes in your, in your graph, you, you have the full joint distribution. 
And the nice thing about that is that you also get uh, an unbiased estimate of the, of the normalizing constant. And you have, you drag with you all the convergence results of SMC into uh, graphical models. The downside is, of course, this is, can be computationally uh, expensive. Um, and you can also, this was sort of what, this is not what Tom talked about, but it's a bit related in that SMC in its classical form I've been talking about runs on a chain, but you can also do this on trees, actually, if, if you want. I'm not diving into that. Let me just finish by pointing, pointing to some more recent work on this blending business. So on the left-hand side, you have deterministic methods, like message passing, uh, like variational inference, like Laplace method. And then on the other hand, you have stochastic methods, or Monte Carlo methods, like MCMC or SMC that we've been talking about. I think we should really be doing more of this, where we use a bit of both. It's not one or the other. How can we, this deserves to be thinking hard about, how can we combine both of them in, in, in a good way? Um, and how, you, for example, you, you can also stay within, MC, within Monte Carlo, and you can combine SMC with MCMC, as I said. Or you can combine SMC with itself, actually, and so on. But in terms of uh, why would you want to combine them? Well, the deterministic methods are, are good in the sense that they are actually very, very good and extremely fast um, in general. But the bad thing is that it's quite hard to do theory of these things. Monte Carlo, on the other hand, you can do quite a lot of theory to have asymptotic consistency. And, and again, there is quite a lot done already. So if you can just frame your problem within SMC, you can, you can just use the theory that's there. The bad thing is that it can be, not necessarily, it can be. Again, we ran this on board the fighter aircraft a long, long time ago, back in 2005, and that worked in real time. But it can, it can suffer from a high computational cost. So, okay, how do we do this blending? Well, SMC has a lot of freedom, actually. So the way I introduced the algorithm was in a very special case. But the proposal distribution that you use, you have a lot of freedom in coming up with what, what the proposal distribution should look like. In fact, coming up with a really good proposal is as hard as the original problem. So why not use variational inference to come up with a proposal? Variational is fast. <coughs> Maybe that can give you good proposals. Then you put them inside SMC so you get the theoretical results. That's a beautiful idea. Um, I'll give some people credits later on. I did not come up with that, but it's a, it's a really good idea. Um, you can also think about these intermediate targets, like when you have a, a general pick your favorite graphical model, then we need to pick intermediate targets. How, how should you pick them? There's a lot of freedom there. Uh, so these two IDs leads to very interesting algorithms, and there's way more to be done here. So to give you a few concrete results, building um, new approximating families of distribution. You have these three papers, which, which came out on archive more or less at the same, same time, and then found their way into different, different conferences. Really nice pieces of work, I must say. Several people in the room on, on these papers. Um, and then this, this other idea, how can I alter these intermediate targets well, you can do it in such a way that you actually take future variables into account, if you like. And that, that gives you <coughs> additional intractability. Well, again, let's pull in the variational stuff and solve them in that way. So that will be, there's a spotlight by a colleague of mine, Frederick, later uh, at some other conference here in town. Um, and then there is, um, the, the comp why not do a bit of both of these? You, so you can use uh, you can use the um, uh, this is called twisting in SMC language. So you, you alter the uh, intermediate target distributions and you think hard about the proposal. So this is at uh, uh, a workshop that they in the week. All right, I should uh, should wrap up. If you find this interesting, I should recommend this thesis by a student of mine. He'll defend in December 14th, which has a few, few of these things in it, so you can have a look if you want. Um, if you're even more keen, we're trying to, to 
um, to tell people about SMC. So we're running a course, PhD level course, uh, which we did a year and a half ago in Uppsala. So these people were there, so around 90 students from 35 different universities. So we're running it's a one week intensive course. We're planning to do the same thing in, in August next year. So you're most welcome if you want. There will be some preliminary information there, more, more information. <coughs> All right, um, so what SMC does is that it gives you <coughs> approximate solutions to integration problems when there is some sequential structure present. If there is no sequential structure present, maybe you can introduce a sequential structure. So again, it's general, at least first, more general than I thought. Uh, it can be computationally challenging, absolutely. The good thing is that we have quite a lot of analysis available. And there's still a lot of this freedom that I hinted at, I showed you quite a few papers, there's way more to be done there, I think. And we've tried to, to write, um, write up SMC more targeted towards machine learning in this foundational trends, trends paper, if you want. Part of it is in, in, um, in Christian's thesis. I should stop there. Thanks for the talk. Uh, there's time for a couple of questions. So the first toy, uh, like the toy mm -hmm. sample that you gave, um, I don't think I fully understood. So there were two measurements, and like the bottom line and the top line? No, sorry. Let, let me in. So there's, there's just one measurement. So the measurement, oh, actually, there were two measurements. So the measurement was the radar that gives it a distance down to ground. Mm -hmm. And then there is a barometer, which I'm not visualizing here, that gives you the altitude over sea levels. So based on that, you, and the map of the area, you can then compute what's the distance down to ground. So this is the measurement equation. H here is a, just notation for a lookup into the database mm -hmm. that, that gives you that information. So that, that was the measurement. What is the top line? So the top line is just the dynamical model. So x is my position, which is a latent unknown variable that I'm trying to figure out. And that's just giving you the dynamics, how that evolves over time. And the dynamics is super simple here. It's just integrating velocity. Of course, you can ask someone working with fighter aircraft. They would come up with super cool dynamics of the aircraft. But again, I don't need that fidelity here. It's enough with an integrator, actually. Any other question? <coughs> okay, I do have one. So, when you explain Birch, you mentioned that it uh, comes up with the other way for you. So, um, does that also is that also the case in, in the nonlinear case? Like if your language is uh, non nonlinear? Yeah, good question. No, no. So the only thing we've we've done so far is if you have a, a model that has both linear and nonlinear elements in it, then it will automatically take care of the linear bits and pieces in closed form in the best way possible. But, but the non-linear bits is just... Yeah. The yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Well, that's, that's, thanks, Mr. Gary.